Good afternoon. During today's legislative hearing, we will consider three bills, S-616 Leach Lake Reservation Restoration Technical Corrections Act of 2023, S-1898 Navajo Gallup Water Supply Project Amendments Act of 2023, and S-1987 uh, Fork Belknap Indian Community Water Rights Settlement Act of 2023. S-616 would make express the Secretary of Agriculture's authority to transfer suitable forest land, uh, for, forest service land located in the Chippewa National Forest in Cass County, Minnesota to the Secretary of the Interior for the benefit of the tribe in fulfillment of the purposes of the Leech Lake Reservation Restoration Act. S-1898 introduced by Senators Lujan and Heinrich would amend the Navajo San Juan ri uh, River Water Rights Settlement to provide the additional time and resources needed to complete the Navajo Gallup Water Supply Project authorized in 2009. Lastly, Senator Tester and Danes introduced Senate uh, S. Uh, 1987, and this bill uh, will authorize and ratify the water rights compact entered into by the Fort Belknap Indian Community, the United States, and the state of Montana in 2001. It would also provide critical water infrastructure and funding for the tribe's water development provide mitigation measures for non-Indian water users, and transfer certain lands into trust for the benefit of the tribe. Before I turn to the vice chair uh, for her opening statement, I'd like to extend my welcome and thanks to our witnesses for joining us today. I look forward to your testimony and our discussion. Vice Chair Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for holding this hearing. Uh, you've mentioned the three bills before us. I'm gonna keep my comments brief because you've already outlined the specifics. Um, but these bills are important as they address the complex tribal water and land issues. Just a couple words here about the uh, Fort Belknap Indian Community Water Rights Settlement Act. We were in this committee almost uh, two years ago, back in October of 21, talking about the need to get all the parties together to make a real push to reach agreement. So I'm pleased that we're here with a settlement with broad support, including from the governor of Montana. That demonstrates great work, so congratulations on that. I think we recognize that the Fort Belknap uh, Indian community is tied to one of the most consequential opinions issued by the Supreme Court on tribal water rights. This is the, the Winters um, versus United States back in 1908, but it's the basis for the federal government's trust responsibility to safeguard water rights for our tribes. And Winters is the reason why Indian water settlements approved by Congress often fund infrastructure for agriculture, for drinking water and sanitation systems on tribal lands. Um, those on this committee know that I have talked long and often about the, the issue of lack of access to, to water in Alaskan villages. Um, we have more than 3,000 households in about 30 native villages that suffer from a total lack of indoor plumbing. That's running water, that's sanitation. Uh, it, it impacts uh, everything from your ability to bathe to... Uh, to uh, disease issues as you, as you try to move human waste um, in, in crude buckets. We have so much more to do here. We've made some great gains, $3.5 billion in the bipartisan infrastructure law to clear the existing backlog of IHS sanitation projects, $2.5 billion to implement existing tribal water settlements. So we recognize that's big, that's a significant step but it doesn't el eliminate the need for the federal government to continue investing in tribal water projects. I think we're just seeing this need grow. Uh, tribes are facing ballooning costs with operating and maintaining this influx of new water projects, especially when these systems come of age. So, Mr. Chairman, I had a, com a conversation with the comptroller of the, uh, of the GAO, Gene Dodaro, about this, and he agreed to my request, which is to launch a GAO study to examine the growing financial costs that tribes may occur for these operating systems. So I'm looking forward to reviewing the results when we get that back. Um, but I think we know we have a lot more to do to provide water to Native communities, and I'm glad that today's hearing um, includes legislation to address this significant unmet need. Thank you, Vice Chair Murkowski. I'll now recognize Senator Tester. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you, Chairman Schatz and Ranking Member Murkowski, for having this hearing. Uh, particular as it applies to the Fort Belknap Indian Community Water Settlement. I would ask unanimous consent to place in the record the following letters of support. Rocky Mountain Tribal Leaders Council, the Wilderness Society, 
State Representative Paul Tuss, Bearpaw Development Corporation, St. Mary's Rehabilitation Working Group, Milk River Joint Board of Control, and Blaine County Conservation District. Without objection. And I think Senator Danes will have some more letters to be put in when he, when he arrives. Um, once again, uh, we are here to talk about the Fort Belknap uh, Indian Community Water Settlement amongst the one of the three bills up. I want to welcome our witnesses, uh, President Jeffrey Stiffarm of Fort Belknap uh, Indian Reservation. Thank you for being here, um, obviously for good reason. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Kristen Juris, uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for making the trek. I think the fact that you're here, Lieutenant Governor, speaks to the fact that this administration uh, thinks this is an important uh, piece of legislation for us to take up. And I just want to thank you for being here in person today. It would have been a lot easier to stay in Montana. It's a pretty good hike to get here. Um, and it is an honor to have you both testify in front of this committee uh, and, and what this means to not only the folks in Fort Belknap, but to the entire state of Montana. The Fort Belknap, Belknap Indian Community Water Settlement has been a long time in the making. Um, I first introduced this bill in 2012, but to be honest with you, for me it even started before that. During my state legislature days, I voted to get this bill out in the Montana legislature. I've been working uh, with folks on the ground like President Dick uh, Stiff, Stiff Arm for over a decade. So to say that I'm pleased uh, that we have a version that takes into account the perspectives of multiple stakeholders coming before this committee with widespread bipartisan support is an understatement. This is a historic day for the Fort Belknap Indian community and for folks across North Central Montana. I've said it before and I'll say it again because my Native American friends taught me this. Water is life. Water is necessary for crops, for our businesses, for our homes, for life. The bipartisan settlement we are looking at today is the result of years of negotiations between the tribe, local elected officials, irrigators, state legislators, federal agencies, and other stakeholders to hammer out a fair compromise that honors our trust and treaty responsibilities while guaranteeing water certainty to all water users in North Central Montana through the rehabilitation of the Milk River Project. This is the last water settlement to be finalized for our great state of Montana. We've got to get this done because in Montana, we make good on our promises and we work together to get things done and find that common ground. And that is exactly what has happened with this settlement. For years, we've talked about moving this settlement forward. And this Congress, we got a real shot. And, and I want to thank the chairman and ranking member because you guys are helping give us that shot. Thanks again to everybody who's here today, the folks that are testifying, even if you're not testifying for the Fort Belknap Water Settlement. And I do know that the BIA will be testifying for it, correct, uh, uh, Mr. Newland? Uh, at any rate, um, this is so, so important uh, to the people of Montana, to the Fort Belknap Indian community. And uh, I look forward to the testimony and I look forward to the opportunity to ask questions. Thank you both. Thank you very much, Senator Tester. We'll now turn to Senator Smith. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Chair Schatz and Vice Chair Murkowski, for holding this hearing today and including my bill, the Leech Lake Reservation Restoration Technical Corrections Act of 2023. Uh, welcome to all of our panelists, and I want to particularly welcome Leech Lake Secretary Treasurer uh, Lenny Finday to the committee today who is here to testify on the importance of this bill to Leech Lake. Um, I want everyone to know that Secretary Treasurer Finday is a tremendous advocate for Leech Lake and has a distinguished background in tribal and Indian law and I'm very grateful for your advocacy on this issue and so many others facing Leech Lake and all of the um, indigenous communities in Minnesota. So in the 1940s, thousands of acres were taken illegally from Leech Lake Band's reservation in secretarial transfers. Three years ago, with support from this committee, we passed a law to make that right. That bill, the Leech Lake Reservation Restoration Act, directed the Department of Interior to transfer the wrongly seized land from the Chippewa National Forest in Cass County, Minnesota, to be held in trust for the Leech Lake Band. Today, we are considering a technical amendment to that land transfer to make two changes. 
The first is to allow for ongoing implementation of the law, and the second is to include in the law an additional approximately 4,400 acres. This land was also wrongly taken from the band, which we discovered during a review of historic records undertaken as we were implementing the 2020 law. These changes, uh, though technical, are crucial for implementing the existing law and to fulfill our goal and our trusted treaty responsibilities of restoring illegally taken lands uh, to Leech Lake. I want to thank the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Interior for being here today to support the bill, and I appreciate uh, your assistance in drafting this technical correction, and also a thank you to the Forest Service for your work to implement the reservation, the Leech Lake Reservation Restoration Act. Colleagues, I ask for your support for this technical correction, which will have a direct and real impact on the lives of Leech Lake Band members. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Smith. We'll now turn to Senator Lujan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and Chairman, thank you and to our Vice Chair for holding this hearing in part to consider my bill amending the Navajo San Juan water rights settlement. And today I'm honored to introduce a friend, um, a great leader, and that is uh, the president of the Navajo Nation, Dr. Boo Nigren, who has traveled here to testify on behalf of this important water rights legislation for the Navajo Nation. Mr. President, thank you for being with us today. Um, he was elected in 2022, Mr. Chairman, as the youngest Navajo Nation president in history at the age of 35. Dr. Nigren is a proud graduate of Red Mesa High School near the four corners of the Navajo Nation. He earned his Bachelor of Science and Master's at Arizona State University and his PhD from the University of Southern California. Dr. Nigren is married to Jasmine Blackwater Nigren, who is a former representative from the state of Arizona. And together they have a young daughter. Both proudly reside in Red Mesa, Arizona, where the president grew up. Uh, Mr. President, we welcome you to be here today. We welcome all of our guests that are here today, friends, leaders from across America. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Senators. Uh, we'll now turn to uh, uh, further witness introductions. Uh, first, we have the Honorable... Brian Newland, Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs for the Department of Interior. We're also pleased to have Mr. John Crockett, the Associate Deputy Chief for State, Private, and Tribal Forestry at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And uh, finally, we have uh, uh, the Honorable Kristen Juris, the Lieutenant Governor of the State of Montana. Uh, I want to remind our witnesses that you have our full written testimony that will be made part of the official hearing record. And if you could please keep your statements uh, uh, to no more than five minutes. I'm told that I um, am reading my script incorrectly, which is not the first time this has happened. Um, <laughs> Senator Lujan has a, a, some opening remarks on the legislation itself. Senator Lujan, I apologize. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. See, this is the, 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 the benefit of being new here, where I should have followed the wisdom of my more senior colleagues and including my opening statement with my introduction of the president. So I apologize to everyone and ask for their indulgence. Um, Mr. Chairman, the Navajo Gallup Water Supply Project amendments of 2023 is vital to ensuring that Congress upholds its promise to the Navajo Nation, the city of Gallup, and the Hickory Apache Nation in New Mexico. In 2009, Congress passed the Navajo San Juan River Water Rights Settlement Act. As a member of the U.S. House of Representatives, I was proud to carry that legislation in the House, and Senator Jeff Bingaman carried that legislation um, here in this body. This project authorized the Navajo Gallup Water Supply Project to pipe water to communities in New Mexico and Eastern Arizona. Without action by Congress, authorization and funding for the project will expire on December 31st, 2024, depriving roughly a quarter million people in Northwestern New Mexico and Arizona the water promised by this settlement in 2009. 2023, between 30 and 40% of households of the Navajo Nation still live without running water. Once completed, the project will help close this water gap and provide a more sustainable supply that will improve public health and economic opportunities for the region. This legislation must be signed into law this Congress 
to ensure work on the Navajo Gallup water supply project that began in 2009 does not grind to a halt. Um, I appreciate the chance to be with you all today and I hope we are in the support of everyone. Before I yield back to Mr. Chairman, I would like to ask for unanimous consent to enter letters of support from the settlement parties and the participants into the record. Without objection. With that, Mr. Chairman, I, I thank you again. I urge my colleagues to support um, these uh, amendments and uh, appreciate uh, all my colleagues for the legislation that they've been working on as well in hopes that we can get this done together. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Lujan. Um, and this was the part where I asked you to keep your uh, remarks to no more than five minutes. Um, and now that all of the uh, uh, testifiers have been introduced, we'll start with uh, Secretary Newland. Uh, please begin with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ani Buju Minogiship. Good afternoon, Chairman Schatz, Vice Chair Murkowski, and members of the committee. My name is Brian Newland. I have the privilege of serving as the Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs at the Department of the Interior, and I appreciate the opportunity to testify on three bills today. The United States acts as a trustee for the land and water rights of tribes, American Indians, and Alaska Natives. In its role as trustee, the federal government has an obligation to advance the interests of the beneficiaries with the highest degree of diligence and skill. The administration strongly supports the resolution of Indian water rights claims through negotiated settlements. These settlements help ensure that citizens of tribal nations have reliable and safe water for drinking, for cooking, and for sanitation. Access to clean water improves the public health and environment on reservations. It enables economic growth. It promotes tribal self-sufficiency, and it helps fulfill the United States trust responsibility to tribes. The department stands ready to work with Congress to advance Indian water rights settlements and uphold our sacred trust responsibilities. S-1987 would approve and provide authorizations to carry out the settlement of the Fort Belknap Indian community's water rights in the state of Montana. The department supports S-1987 and does suggest some technical changes to aid in its implementation. This bill would resolve the tribe's water rights claims in Montana by recognizing the water rights established in the Montana Fort Belknap Water Rights Compact. S-1987 authorizes $1.1 billion in federal appropriations for the design and construction of water projects that would benefit the tribes and non-native users in Montana. The bill also authorizes appropriations for the rehabilitation and expansion of the Fort Belknap Indian Irrigation Project and the Milk River Project. The department does suggest a feasibility study for both projects to avoid cost gaps and guarantee completion. S-1987 also authorizes or identifies the Bureau of Indian Affairs as the lead agency for the project, although previous water settlements uh, typically authorize the Bureau of Reclamation for that work. The department suggests utilizing the Bureau of Reclam Reclamation as the lead agency for improvements to that project. And we believe that this legislation would bring meaning to the legal victory that the tribes and the United States secured more than a century ago in the historic Winters case. We support S-1987 with the technical changes just mentioned. The Navajo Gallup Water Supply Project was first authorized in 2009 and settled the Navajo Nation's water rights in the San Juan Basin of New Mexico. When completed, the project will provide a reliable and sustainable domestic, municipal, and industrial water supply from the San Juan River to 43 chapters of the Navajo Nation, including its capital in Window Rock, Arizona, as well as the city of Gallup and the southwest portion of the Hickoria Apache Reservation. S-1898 provides an additional authorization of $725 million to complete the project. $689 million will be used to address a cost gap. $30 million would be used to uh, support Navajo community connections to the water transmission line. And $6 million would be used for renewable energy features that would save energy costs on the overall project. This bill also extends the date by which the project must be completed to December 31st, 2029, and eliminates double taxation of goods and services. The department appreciates the willingness of the Navajo Nation, the Hickorya Apache Nation, the city of Gallup, and the state of New Mexico to reach consensus on these issues, and we support S-1898. 
S616 is a technical amendment to Public Law 116-255 to authorize the transfer of additional lands in the Chippewa National Forest in Minnesota that met the same criteria listed in the original act. This amendment is necessary to allow for the ongoing implementation and to allow for the inclusion of additional lands that the department may identify in the future. In addition to flexibility for ongoing implementation, S616 would also authorize an acre for acre substitution of land with the Chippewa National Forest if the band identifies certain parcels that are unsuitable for future use. The department supports S616 as well. So Chairman Schatz and Vice Chair Murkowski, members of the committee, I wanna thank you again for this opportunity to testify. And as always, I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much. Mr. Crockett, please proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon, Chairman Schatz, Vice Chair Murkowski, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today uh, and provide the perspective of the USDA Forest Service on two tribal bills under consideration for today. As Associate Deputy Chief for State, Private, and Tribal Forestry, I'm responsible for the administrative oversight of the Office of Tribal Relations, including, co in co including coordination and collaboration with all deputy areas across the agency to fulfill our trust responsibility to tribal nations. The Forest Service is responsible for managing millions of acres of lands and waters, uh, which are the ancestral homes of American Indians and Native American tribal nations. Many of those lands and waters lie within areas where tribes have reserves right, reserved rights to hunt, fish, and prey by ratified treaties and agreements with the United States. As part of fulfilling that trust responsibility, we fully share in the administration's commitment to strengthen the nation-to-nation -nation responsibility. This includes a focus on co-stewardship, respectful application of indigenous knowledge, and the protection of sacred sites. The Department of Agriculture is committed to continually improving our relationship with tribes. I appreciate the opportunity to share the Forest Service perspective on these two bills today. S-116, the Leech Lake Reservation Restoration Technical Corrections Act of 2023, would amend the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe Reservation Restoration Act um, to address the illegal transfer of lands from the Department of Interior to the USDA for the inclusion as part of the Chippewa National Forest. This bill would direct the USDA to transfer specified lands within the Chippewa National Forest to the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe, specifically those land that was sold without the consent of the majority of the rightful landowners, according to the records of the BIA. Additionally, this bill would allow for further, uh, allow you, the USDA to transfer lands to tribes on a rolling basis as land that is identified and surveys are completed. The technical amendments to S1, to S616 would address the newly identified acreage not included in the original legislation. USDA appreciates and supports the intent of this act. S1987 modifies and ratifies a specified water rights compact amongst the state of Montana and the Fort Belknap uh, Indian Reservation. Um, the tribes of the Fort Be Belknap Indian Reservation, among other things, it requires the tribes water rights to be held in trust for the benefit of the community and their allottees as directed by the Department of Interior and the Department of uh, Agriculture to negotiate with the state of Montana the exchange of those specified parcels on reservation as, as well as off reservation. The USDA and other agencies within USDA support the broad goals of this legislation and stand ready to work with the bill sponsors, the committee, and the implementing agencies to provide additional technical assistance on this legislation. This concludes my testimony, and thank you for the opportunity to testify, and happy to answer any questions when the time is ready. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Secretary Treasurer Fine Day, please proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Anin Minogizic, Chairman Schatz, Vice Chair Murkowski, and committee members. My name is Lenny Fine Day, and I'm honored to serve as Secretary Treasurer of the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe. I'm here today to speak to the need for S619 or 616 and to briefly share the appalling history of illegal takings and loss of land from our reservation. I first wanna thank Senator Smith and this committee for the work that you have done to enact the Restoration Act back in 2020, which directs the Secretary of Agriculture to return, quote, approximately 11,760 acres, unquote, of lands under the control of the Chippewa National Forest to the Secretary of Interior to be held in trust for the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe. For more than a century, the Leech Lake people have worked diligently to restore the lands our ancestors reserved for us. 
The Restoration Act is a culmination of generations of work to restore a very small portion of our reservation that was illegally transferred more than half a century ago. The Restoration Act and the technical correction will enable Leech Lake to address the severe housing needs our citizens have to improve access to wild rice beds and culturally significant areas of our reservation and restore a measure of justice to our people. The Leech Lake Reservation was established through a series of treaties and executive orders in the mid 1800s. As this committee knows, the United States did not give us our lands or reservation. Instead, through these treaties, we, see, we ceded millions of acres of our homelands to help establish what is now the state of Minnesota. In return, the United States promised that the Leech Lake Reservation would serve as our permanent home. However, shortly after the last executive order was signed to finalize the boundaries of our reservation, Congress enacted a series of laws designed to take our lands, disseminate our government, and destroy our way of life. My written testimony provides a detailed history of these takings, which started with the Nelson Act of 1889, the establishment of the Chippewa National Forest at the turn of the century, and the series of administrative takings known as secretarial transfers that occurred in the 1940s and 50s. Today, because of these laws and administrative actions, less than 5% of our treaty guaranteed homelands are in protected trust status. The Restoration Act focused on restoring the illegal Secretary of Transfer lands to our reservation. The need for the technical correction arose during implementation of the Restoration Act. As the agencies worked to identify documents associated with parcels for restoration, the Bureau of Land Management Indian Land Surveyor completed a record search and review of all BIA land transfers during the 1940s and 50s. The surveyor found that more than 16,000 acres of land currently held by the Forest Service were acquired through the illegal secretary transfer process, far more than the approximate 11,760 acres estimated in the act. The injustice that took place more than half a century ago was clearly underestimated, and that's why we are back before the committee today. I truly want to thank the BLM for its transparency, the Forest Service for its partnership throughout this process, and Senators Smith and Klobuchar for introducing the technical correction. The technical correction simply amends the Restoration Act to meet the original intent of the act, which is to restore all the lands that were wrongly taken from our reservation. The impact of Congress taking action to restore lands wrongfully taken from Leech Lake people cannot be overstated. Dispossession of Indian lands on the Leech Lake Reservation have impacted generations of people on the Leech Lake Reservation by, per by per perpetuating historical trauma, fostering resentment toward federal agencies and their staff charged with the care of these lands, limiting access to spiritually and culturally significant lands and resources, as well as exacerbating social issues related to homelessness and overcrowded housing. Stories of Leech Lake people showing up at their family lands only to find a U.S. Forest Service gate and learning of a transfer of their land to the Forest Service years after the action are unfortunately all too common on Leech Lake. These stories will change only through passage of the bill today. I know that passage of the Restoration Act on 2020 was a day many people will not forget. It marks a big step toward recognizing and correcting the social inequity and injustice that have been a lived experience for our people and our families. I again want to thank this committee for its work on returning these illegally transferred lands, which will guarantee a governing land base for future generations. I ask this committee to advance the bill so that we can fully accomplish the original intent of the Restoration Act. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Miigwech. I'm prepared to answer any questions. Thank you very much. President Nigren, please proceed with your testimony. Oh, okay. First time, too. So, <laughs> so Yate, Chairman Schatz, uh, Vice Chairman Murkowski, and Senator Lujan, and members of the committee, my name is Boo Nigren. I'm the president of the Navajo Nation, representing the voices and aspirations of the Navajo people. Thank you for your opportunity for hearing my testimony today on the Navajo Gallup Water Supply Amendments Act of 2023, S-1898. Thank you also to Senator, again, to Senator Lujan, Senator Heinrich for their leadership for, on this critical legislation, which ensure the thousands of Navajo people have safe, uh, reliable drinking water supply. The Navajo Nation provides governmental services to more than 400,000 members 
Our, our on-reservation population accounts for over one-third of all natives living in Indian country. Our reservation encompasses more than 17 and a half million acres, spans portions of 11 counties across the states of Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah. Unfortunately, ensuring adequate drinking water for our members continues to be a struggle. About 30% of the Navajo households continue to lack running water. They rely on hauling water to meet their daily needs. To address this dire situation in 2005, the, the nation entered into the San Juan settlement with the state of New Mexico. In exchange for the water development projects, including the Navajo Gallup water supply project, the nation agreed to quantify its water rights, release claims to the water in the San Juan River Basin. In 2009, Congress approved the San Juan settlement and authorized the Bureau of Reclamation to construct the Navajo Gallup water supply. The Navajo Gallup Water Supply Project is an essential initiative to address the critical needs of the Navajo Nation and the surrounding communities in western New Mexico. This region has long suffered from limited access to clean and reliable water, resulting in immense uh, hardship for our people. The Navajo Gallup Water Project represents a beacon of hope, promising a few brighter future for our communities. The project is designed to serve a quarter million people. The areas to serve by the areas to be served by the project currently rely on depleting groundwater supply that is poor quality, and the existing supply is inadequate to meet the demands of more than 43 Navajo local governments, the city of Gallup, the TP junction at the Hickory Apache Nation. The 2009 acts requires the project features to be completed no later than December 2024 unless the parties agree to extend the completion date. The project construction cost estimate of $870 million as provided in 2009 was based on appraisal level designs and cost estimate. The number of elements increased in the projects are beyond the anticipated 2009 Act. Among the factors are greater expenses that are expected uh, for water treatment plants to meet Safe Drinking Water Act requirements, engineering challenges in diverting water from the San Juan River, and a 40-year high inflation rate. Since 2009, Reclamation has developed a project working cost estimate based on final detailed design and engineering. The current working estimate shows that the revised construction ceiling of $2.175 billion will adequately support the completion of this critical project. This legislation amends the 2009 Act in a number of important ways for ensuring the Act can be fully implemented. Let me highlight some of the most important, important, important amendments to this legislation. First, this bill increases project funding by increasing the appropriation ceiling to allow for the completion of the project. Second, the bill extends the completion deadline for the project from 2024 to 2029. Third, the bill allows for a deferral of construction of facilities to save operation and maintenance costs associated with the facility. Finally, the bill creates operation and maintenance trust funds for the Navajo Nation and the Hickory Apache. The completion of the Navajo Gallup Water Supply Project will bring transformative changes in the lives of our people. If S-1898 is not enacted, the San Juan settlement and the completion of the project will be threatened. Failure here would further increase the cost of the project, worsen the drinking water crisis, bring uncertainty to all the water users in the San Juan River Basin in New Mexico. Therefore, I respectfully urge this esteemed committee to support S-1898 and provide additional funding needed to complete this critical initiative. Let us come together to create a future in which our people thrive, our culture flourishes, and our land is sustained for generations to come. Thank you, President Nygren. President Stiffarm, please proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon, everyone. Good I'd like to thank um, Chairman Schatz and uh, Ranking Member um, McCoskey. Uh, special thank yous to uh, Senator Tester and Senator Danes for um, working really hard with Fort Belknap, you know, the Winters Tribe, as it was um, said earlier. You know, um, Port Belknap in 1908 won the settlement and the U.S. Supreme Court uh, says um, you can't have the land without the water. Basically, and it, it, it sent, set the way for um, Indian nations across this country to get their fair share of water. And here we are today, a century later, you know, finally Port Belknap's can be able to settle their water and we were the tribes that um, 
got it set up for all Indian country across this um, great country of ours to um, get their water. And um, we're here to um, testify on behalf of my people back home, the uh, chiefs that were before me that worked hard on this bill to get this done. Former President um, Andrew Work worked very hard on this, my predecessor, and I want to thank him for his hard work and you all for helping him get to where it is today. And it landed on my lap to um, provide testimony on our water that we worked hard. And it's not only going to provide um, clean drinking water for the people of Port Ballap, of the uh, Ani and Dakota people, but up and down the High Line from Blackfeet Country all the way down to um, Port Peck Reservoir. And it's going to provide um, cleaner and higher quality um, drinking water all the way down to Milk River. And we worked hard with it, the Governor Gene Forte, and I'm very proud and honored to have the Lieutenant Governor here to sit beside me to uh, testify on behalf of our bill here today to um, get it moving forward for the future of our, um, our children and our grandchildren. That's who we're all here for, and, um, not ourselves. There's, um, the bill is about 1.3 billion, and it's all for infrastructure and the St. Mary's project. And it's well-deserved for our community members back home that live in poverty. And you guys all heard our stories, how we lived and we walked of our ancestors, you know, the lands that we sacrificed, the lives that were sacrificed to put us to where we're at here today. The hard work that we did, you know, my team sitting behind me, my wife and my, uh, my chiefs come here to support me. It's been a long road, very difficult decisions that we had to make back home to put us to where we're at here today. We succeeded, ceded a lot of land away that we wanted that was rightfully ours, that was taken from us. Gold was discovered in our poor cap mountains. We put that aside and we thought, you know, water is more important. And that's what we decided. That's how we got our bill to where it is today. And we want to thank, um, you know, the community members back home that gave us the patience and understanding to come over here and travel quite a bit to um, talk to our senators. You know. Hard to respect you, Senator Danes, and the work you did for us, and Senator Tester. You know, we did a lot of work. Um, we had we suffered a lot to 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 get our bill here on the table, and a lot of things that we wanted in this bill are not in here. But we're willing to do that to um, provide this water for our community members, our elders, our children, and it's going to provide hope. We have a high rate of. Um, Suicides back home, you know, my son was one of them. And a lot of it is because we don't have um, the general necessities that you all live here today in the city of Washington, D.C. You don't have clean drinking water. We don't have homes. But what this bill is going to provide for our people is hope, something to fight for, something to stand for. I'm glad that um, you're here to give me a little bit of your time to tell you about the things that we gave up to, to put us to where we're at today, the hard work that we provided to get our settlement done. And I look forward to working for you guys in the future to get this completed. And I'm here to answer any more questions. And again, I want to thank Lieutenant Cheers for being here today. Good to hear you. Thank you, President. Lieutenant Governor Juris, welcome. Please proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon, Chair Schatz, Vice Chair Murkowski, and committee members. My name is Kristen Juris, and I am the Lieutenant Governor of the State of Montana. And it is truly a privilege to appear before you on behalf of my beloved state and Governor Gianforte in support of Senate Bill 1987. Water is one of Montana's most valued resources. As Senator Tester noted, water is life. Not only for our communities, it's the lifeblood of our number one industry, agriculture. And like many Western states, we don't have enough of it. Giving rise to the adage, whiskeys for drinking, waters for fighting. But rather than fight, in the 1970s, Montana made the commitment to resolve tribal 
and federal enclave reserved water rights through negotiation rather than litigation. And let me tell you, as a water rights attorney, water rights litigation often takes far longer than you expected. It is far more expensive than you expected. And most unfortunately, it pits neighbors against neighbors and tr even tribes against tribes. Montana was the first and only state to form a standing water compact commission. And over the past five decades, working with our tribal and federal partners, we have seen remarkable success. The Fort Belknap Compact is the final settlement to come before Congress for approval in a series of 18 compacts that equitably apportion water resources between the state and its people and the several Indian tribes and federal enclaves. The Fort Belknap Compact was overwhelmingly approved by the Montana legislature in 2001 and signed by then Governor Judy Martz. As Vice Chair Murkowski noted, this is a particularly historic settlement, given that the Fort Belknap Reservation was the site of the dispute that gave rise to the U.S. Supreme Court's seminal Indian water rights ruling, Winters versus United States. And yes, President Stiffarm, it is after a century time to close this circle and grant this tribe the water rights that were intended for them. Since state ratification of the compact in 2001, it has taken a significant amount of time, resources, and investments from many parties in order to come before you today with a negotiated agreement that has achieved broad-based nonpartisan support. President Stiffarm, thank you and the Tribal Council for your leadership and commitment in reaching this milestone. You are a man of courage. I also want to thank the state's chief negotiator, Jay Weiner, the members of the state and federal negotiating teams, and all of our staff behind each of these teams that provides critical support, including behind me, our director of the B Department of Natural Resources, Amanda Castor, and our Natural Resource Council in the Governor's Office, Rachel Meredith. In water circles, we talk about paper water, the tribe's water rights as described in the compact, versus wet water, the tribe's ability to actually put the water to use on their fields and in their homes. Without significant investment in water system infrastructure, the tribe's water rights will remain paper water rather than wet water. That is why Senate Bill 1987 is so critical. Through significant investments in water infrastructure and projects, this legislation transforms paper water into wet water, and quite frankly, without it, significant portions of the tribe's water rights will remain on paper. The Montana legislature has also repeatedly appropriated millions of dollars in state support for Indian water rights compacts. The state has already fully funded the contemplated state contribution in S 1987, which is intended to support the construction of a dam and reservoir on People's Creek. It has also previously contributed to the repair of the St. Mary's Canal and ongoing support to the St. Mary's Working Group. Section 6 of the bill provides for the transfer of approximately 22,000 acres of state trust land located within and adjacent to the reservation for federal lands of equal value, allowing further consolidation of the tribe's land base and reducing jurisdictional conflicts between the tribes and the state. Montana is proud to stand with its partners in advocating the passage of this meaningful water rights settlement, which brings an important chapter of Montana history to a close. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I stand for any questions. Thank you. Thank you to all the testifiers. Uh, with the vice chair's concurrence, we're going to uh, start with the uh, introducers of, the, of these various pieces of legislation. And so, uh, Senator Tester, followed by Senator Daines. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your, your courtesy. And uh, Senator Daines and I both know uh, this has been a long trail. Um, and the fact that we're here, uh, everybody on the same page, whether it's Steve and I or uh, the governor's office or the tribe or, or the folks around uh, the tribe in north central Montana, um, I just can't express my appreciation enough. This question is you, for you, uh, President Stiffarm. Uh, as you are well aware, the goal of any water settlement is to provide water infrastructure that's needed, wet water, as the governor, as Lieutenant Governor said. 
um, that takes into effect things like changing climates, distance to water sources, and a bunch of other things. Uh, the goal is to avoid cost of litigation. And Lieutenant Governor, I did not know you were a water rights attorney, so you come at this from a from a real life perspective. Uh, but but President Stiffarm, can you share your perspective, your perspective as a representative of the people of Fort Belknap, on why this settlement that we're discussing today is the best way to resolve the water rights issue in Fort Belknap that was established, has been already said by the winner's case, and how this settlement will secure water access for your tribe for the next 100 years? Thank you for the question, Senator Tester. Like I stated earlier, you know, and it's been said that throughout these um, testimonies that, you know, water is life. Without that, we are nothing. And without the work that you all have done to help us secure this water settlement, um, it's going to mean fresh drinking water for um, Fort Bonham Agency and, and for communities in the south end of the res reservation of Hayes and Lodgepole. Um, we're going to be able to um, redo our um, irrigation district in the north end, which is 100% operated by Native American tribal members, and um, redo our irrigation system in the south end our farmers and ranches out there. You know, um, Port Bonnup is, primary income is is farming and ranching. You know, so this water means a lot to us. You know, this dam that we're gonna build is gonna benefit um, the communities of, um, like I said, all the way from Pecani country down into the um, Port Peck Reservoir. You know, for the, 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 those farmers and ranchers that are above river from us and below river. So, we're bringing life to the high line, is what we're doing. And I want to thank you for that. Going to have. Thank you. Lieutenant Governor Juris, as I said before, it's a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you for your work and the administration's work on this settlement. Um, as you've said, Montana has a strong record of collaborating uh, on water settlements, and your work has carried that tradition on. Thank you. You wear many hats as Lieutenant Governor of the State of Montana. You serve as co-chair of the St. Mary's Rehabilitation Project through that role. Um, you know how important it is to rehabilitating the St. Mary's Canal and what, how critical it is to North Central Montana. As we learned with the DOI testimony, and Brian, thank you for your testimony, uh, the rehabilitation of St. Mary's will provide 35,000 acre feet of water mitigation required to this compact. Could you talk about the overall importance of fixing St. Mary's. And we've heard the president talk about the tribal perspective. I want you to talk about the fixing St. Mary's and its potential to uh, expand access to water across North Central Montana. Yes, Senator Tester. The St. Mary's Canal System, and we call it the Milk River Project, is critical for the High Line communities and agriculture. It irrigates over 120,000 acres. It provides water to four uh, cities and towns and two rural communities. And without it, literally, people would have to leave that area of the state. It, it would cause uh, great economic harm if we do not maintain the viability of the St. Mary system. As you know, we had some, uh, it was built in the early 1900s. We had the collapse of some structures in 2000. Uh, thankfully, this body, Congress, approved repairs. Montana also contributed to some of those repairs. But that uh, was just one of many repairs that needs. So it's absolutely critical to the Montana economy, as well as the communities that that canal serves. For the... Uh purview of the committee, the St. Mary's project is an engineering marvel. It was built over 100 years ago. It's probably been wore out for 40 years. And uh, it's just an amazing piece of infrastructure built uh, several generations ago. I want to thank everybody that has worked on this bill. I want to thank the witnesses for their testimony. Um, I'd like to quickly note for the record uh, that uh, there are a handful of drafting areas within this bill. Um, I look forward to correcting these errors in a substitute amendment, and we'll work with the agencies here on technical assistance in order to get this bill out the door quickly. Uh, lastly, I want to thank uh, President Stiffarm and all the folks that have worked on this bill, your predecessors. You mentioned Andy Work, but the truth is it's a long list uh, because this has been going on a long time. Today's hearing is a testament to what hard work and determination get done if you fight, 
and work for Common Sense Solutions. It hasn't been easy, and I make no mistake about it, we have much work left to do, but I remain committed, as you do, as Senator Danes does, to getting this done. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Tester. Senator Danes. Chairman Schatz, thank you, as well as the Vice Chairman Murkowski. Lieutenant Governor Juris, welcome. President Stiffarm, thank you. Both of you are not only uh, colleagues who work together on important issues, I consider both of you friends. And it's, glad, it's really good to have you here. Um, the Lieutenant Governor not only is a water rights attorney, she also was born in the same hometown as my grandpa. So uh, some of these uh, relations go back a long ways. Well, today's historic. It really is. I, did, I sometimes wonder if we'd ever get to this point to have this kind of hearing. And when I was first elected to the House in 2012, it's over a decade ago, this is one of the first issues I heard about. I heard about it from the tribe. I heard about it from the county commissioners, Phillips County and Blaine County. Both sides wanted to set me straight on their strong opinions on this um, compact. Less than just a year ago, this settlement still had opposition from numerous groups. And here's the truth of the matter. It was going nowhere. It was going nowhere. And as President Stiff Arm so well articulated, I think we had to put aside the concerns for only ourselves and think about future generations. And he says it's been a century long battle. And President Stiff Arm, I commend you and your courage your leadership to say, I want to solve this problem. Because for 10 years, the bill got introduced, and it was press releases, but it wasn't actually going to get an outcome. And through your leadership and your willingness to figure out a path forward, the courage, we are here. We buckled down the last six months. The governor's team, as well as Department of Interior, and President Stiff Arms team held the first of many intense negotiations. It got intense at times. I worked with our county commissioners. They got intense at times. Working with our Montana's farming and ranching communities. And as Lieutenant Governor talked about whiskey and water, that is really true in a place that has a lot less water than whiskey. We came to a compromise. And Senator Tester and I introduced a bipartisan bill. I'm proud to say that today, for the first time ever, we have the support of Montana's entire congressional delegation. We have the support from Governor Gianforte and his administration. We have the support of the tribe. We have the support of every affected county commission. We have support of the agriculture groups and many more for this critically important bill. It is hard to ever get that group aligned on about anything. And yet here we are today. And again, President Stiffarm, I commend you for your leadership and vision. Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to place in the record the following letters of support. The Blaine County Commission, Phillips County Commission, Hill County Commission, Valley County Commission, Governor Greg Gianforte, the Montana Stock Growers Association, the Montana Farm Bureau, and letters from elected officials. Without objection. Again, this bill is a result of a lot of compromise, years, actually a century of work or more, and it will be a major benefit to Montana. It fully settles costly water rights litigation. I'm grateful the Lieutenant Governor Juris went to law school. I didn't. I'm not a lawyer. I went to engineering school, that other school, a couple hundred miles away from Missoula. It fully funds the rehabilitation of the Milk River, Milk River Project, which is the lifeblood for our farmers and ranchers, both on and off the reservation. All you have to do is just get in a, if you ever fly over that part of the state, you can see where it's green and where it's not. Yeah. It's very, very clear what, in terms of that water being the lifeblood. It invests in infrastructure to provide clean drinking water and irrigation for tribal and non-tribal members. And it protects existing easements and leases. The Fort, Nap, Fort Belknap Water Rights Settlement Act is truly a win. It's a win, it's a win, it's a win 
for Montana. President Stiffarm, Lieutenant Governor Juris, welcome. This bill is critical for both the state and the tribe. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Juris, you spent time, considerable time, working toward a practical solution that benefits Montana. How does the current bill protect private property rights, increase investment in agriculture, and address the complex land ownership issues that we face in Montana? Well, as I noted in my testimony, it, it avoids expensive and lengthy and unpredictable litigation. In Montana, we uh, follow the prior appropriation doctrine, which grants seniority to first in time, first in right. So it actually provides predictability not only for the tribes, but also for the state water right holders, because the tribes water rights date back prior to almost all state holders, and all of those rights are junior. And so until the tribes water rights are confirmed and finalized, junior water right holders cannot finalize that. And of course, our water rights are very important property right. It also provides for mitigation of, on the impact of off-reservation water users through the rehabilitation of the St. Mary Canal and, and Fresno and other water structures. And without Senate Bill 1987, the tribe's water rights will remain paper water rights and will continue to have that uncertainty. It's a really important point because if anybody who's dealt with water out west knows in terms of uh, the date of that right determines <laughs> priority. And uh, that's that point you made about the tribe's rights, you know, predating a lot of the other rights is really important. And we don't settle that. We can never resolve this issue. So it's a really important point why we need to get this done. President Stiff Farm, the tribe has made numerous concessions in order to get to where we are today. Thank you for your work. Your grandchildren and my grandchildren and our great-grandchildren will thank you for your work. The bill before us is a compromise for the state, the tribe, the federal government, dozens of local leaders and groups. There's still work to do from this point forward, but this is a really important monumental step. My question for you, President Stiff Farm, how does the bill enhance the tribe's water resources and ensure that your members have access to clean drinking water and sustainable irrigation. Thank you for the question, Senator Davis. And um, first of all, I wanna thank you for those, um, those words that you shared with me. And, you know, keep me humble and grounded and I appreciate those. Very helpful. Um, what this water settlement is gonna mean for the, the people of Fort Bellamp and the and surrounding communities is um, clean drinking water, water for the future like we talked about, our children and our grandchildren and great-grandchildren. You know, that's what we're all here for. That's all we're all surviving here today is for our children and grandchildren and, and for their lives, for better lives. In the south end, we'll, we'll be um, pumping water out of the Missouri River up into the Hayes and Lodgeville communities, which doesn't have clean drinking water because of the um, mining devastation that we had from uh, Resort Milandusky mine, the runoff from the mountains there. So we we're gonna be able to provide some clean drinking water in the south end of the communities. Also um, infrastructure to um, the homes that we plan on building. You know, back home we got um, two or three generations living in one home. And um, with some of the, uh, the money that we're gonna use and be able to do some wells and build homes further out from the communities and then, um, like I said, provide better, cleaner drinking water and um, irrigation systems for our farmers and ranchers um, up and down the High Line. And it's gonna, um, like I said, provide hope where there was no hope before. And I wanna thank you for your help. And again, Lieutenant Governor, I'm very honored to be sitting next to you and listen to your testimony. Gonna hail. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I know I'm, I'm well over time. I have a question for Mr. For Mr. Newland, uh, Chairman Schatz. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. It's a century in the making here, you know, but it's uh, uh, this will be quick, and uh, I'd appreciate a brief answer. The, the stars of the panel are over here right now, but, uh, but you've got a really important part of this input because we don't go anywhere without your assistance going forward. Um, first of all, thank you for all your help on this. 
and uh, a lot of the work now will go into we working together, moving this forward. And uh, the cooperation has been noted and uh, appreciated. How important is it to finalize this last remaining water settlement in the state of Montana and have a bill that could be implemented at the state, federal, and local level? Thank you, Senator, for that question. I, I think the, uh, your comment hit the nail on the head. It's a century in the making since the Winters case uh, that the United States brought as trustee. And I think uh, getting this done will, will uh, in a large measure, uh, fulfill our uh, big part of our trust obligation to the tribes and the people who live in, the, in their communities back home on the reservation to get them actual wet water. Thanks for the brief answer and thanks for all your help. Mr. Chairman, thanks. Thank you, Senator Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Secretary, Treasurer Fine Day, um, Migwich, and thank you again for being here uh, with our committee. Um, I very much appreciated your testimony as you reviewed some of the history of the illegal land transfers, um, which is, of course, as you pointed out, part of the long legacy of taking land from the Ojibwe people in this place that is now known as Minnesota. Um, and across the country. Um, I'm wondering if your testimony was excellent. I'm wondering if there was anything in your testimony regarding that history that you'd just like an opportunity to highlight before I ask you one other question. Thank, thank you, Senator, for that uh, uh, question. And of course, I could speak on the, the history here for a very long time. I'm sure bore the committee to death, and I won't, I won't do that today. Um, other than just to uh, point out very specifically uh, the, the, uh, these transfers that are subject to the Restoration Act and to this technical correction uh, really arose from the termina termination era. Uh, even though Leech Lake wasn't specifically targeted as a termination tribe, it was still the mindset of the federal government at that time uh, in order to eliminate the burden of administering the land on our reservation. Uh, so Congress passed an amendment to the Indian Reorganization Act on May 14, 1948 that authorized the Secretary of Interior to issue fee patents to Indian allotments to prepare them for sale. Uh, under the new law, the BIA also began to administratively transfer ownership of allotments to other governmental agencies, such as the United States Department of Agriculture. These administrative transfers were known uh, as secretarial transfers. The problem at Leech Lake, and why this was uh, specific to Leech Lake, is because we have the Chippewa National Forest that's basically superimposed within the boundaries of our reservation. And so the fact that the forest and the reservation are one and the same uh, really made uh, the administration of these transfers especially enticing to BIA officials in the 40s and 50s. However, it wasn't until 1979 that the Department of Interior formally acknowledged that these transfers were illegal. Mm -hmm. The Interior Solicitor interpreted the uh, act of May 14, 1948 to require, quote, unanimous consent of all heirs before the interest in those allotments could be conveyed, unquote. And that didn't happen in this situation. And so while we can look at the overall consequences of the Termination Act and the allotment period on Indian country, you know, correcting this specific wrong mm -hmm. for the illegal taking of land at Leech Lake is a much more straightforward task, and it's just return the land. Thank you very much. And for the unfortunate people who have never had a chance to visit uh, northern Minnesota and uh, the home of uh, Leech Lake Band, can you just explain what the land is like? And um, yeah. particularly I'm thinking about, I was just looking at a map of uh, the uh, tribal nation land and um, we have big lakes and yes. lots of water. Yes. Not meaning to be disrespectful to our friends from Montana <laughs> and <laughs> the Navajo Nation. <laughs> Well, very importantly, thank again, thank you for that question, Senator. And very importantly, uh, the Leech Lake Reservation is an extremely resource-rich reservation. Yes. Um, we are actually the first reservation, uh, federally recognized reservation, that the Mississippi River flows through um, from its uh, headwaters at the, um, Lake Itasca. We have several large uh, lakes, as you had mentioned. We have Lake Winnebogoshish, we have Leech Lake, and we have Cass Lake, mm -hmm. as well as many other lakes. And uh, for those of you who may know one of the mottos of Minnesota is that we are the land of 10,000 lakes and so we have over a thousand of those lakes within the boundaries of the Leech Lake Reservation. Uh, we have a lot of forest land uh, and uh, which is very specifically unique to us as Ojibwe people as well. 
uh, with our migration story, mm -hmm. uh, starting out on the um, East Coast many, many, many generations ago and receiving a prophecy to go west to the place where food grows on water. A lot of the uh, resources on our reservation include that food that grows on water, what we call monomen or the good berry, or uh, what's also known as wild rice. Uh, and we protect that wild rice. And, and that's where uh, this bill specifically, even though it deals with land, the lands that we are working with the Forest Service to identify will help us ensure that we are protecting wild rice beds uh, within the lakes and rivers of the reservation. Uh, and so it's a very resource rich place and, and we're doing our part to do all we can to protect and preserve it for generations to come. And not just for the Leech Lake people, but for everybody to enjoy. Thank you very much. It, um the home of Monomen, and also the need because of so much surface water, the need for buildable land for the reservation so that you have places yeah. to address the severe housing shortage that you are experiencing as well. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Lujan. Lujan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Assistant Secretary Newland, I have a, a series of yes or no questions. Um, yes or no, does the Gallup, uh, the Navajo Gallup, Water Supply Project Amendment Act of 2023 integrate all recommendation from the Interior Working Group on Indian Water Settlements provided last November? Yes. And so this bill has the Interior's support? Yes. Much of the project is already complete with water deliveries from the Cutter Lateral having begun in 2020 and 21. More than 50% of the remaining pipeline, the San Juan lateral, is also complete, but the project needs more time and resources to get the job done. Assistant Secretary, absent Congress's authorization to provide additional time and resources, what will happen after December 31st, 2024? Uh, the, the work would stop on, on the construction programs and the funding you know, would run out. Appreciate that. Groundwater levels for the city of Gallup have dropped approximately 200 feet over the past 10 years. Uh, I also was proud to work with colleagues and secured congressionally directed spending in fiscal year 2023 for the city of Gallup to drill a new well to help meet its needs until the project can deliver water to the city. In the meantime, thousands on the Navajo Nation rely on hauling water to meet their daily needs. Mr. President, how many Navajo households currently do not have running water? Yeah, Senator, uh, uh, the the percentages that we've been using for households across Navajo is about 30%. So I think in terms of New Mexico, if I were to just assume it'd be in the thousands, maybe anywhere between 10 to 15,000 on the New Mexico side. I know across Navajo, it's probably 50 to 60,000, but just on the New Mexico side, I know it's in the thousands, but I can definitely get you a more accurate number when I get one. And then, um, yep. I appreciate that, Mr. President, and um, look forward to working with you and through maybe NTUA to, to get those numbers as well for the committee. So appreciate that. And Mr. President, how has inadequate water supply affected the Navajo Nation? Uh, having grown uh, thank you senator uh, having grown up without running water uh, hauling water myself uh, heating water on a stove with a propane tank and even to the point where uh, making sure in the winter uh, being able to chip the waters because uh, the the bear the 55 gallon barrels get frozen and then in the summers using a hose to suck out the water out of the out of the the gallons or even at times when we didn't have a big enough vehicle we would haul water from the city, whether it's Farmington or Gallup or Cortez in five gallon buckets from uh, outside of the gas stations. They usually have spigots and filling those buckets up takes a lot of work and effort to bring it home. So I do, I do truly understand the struggles of not growing up with running water or electricity. And I know that if those were there, life would be a little easier. You'd have a lot more time to focus on school. You'd have a lot more time to focus on spending time with your family. The quality of life and the quality of your health would go up dramatically because when you don't have enough water and you're constantly thinking about how can I conserve, how can I use less, how can I make sure that we have enough to bathe, how can we make sure that we have enough to cook with, it's uh, tough decisions because 
Farmington from my home community was about 70 miles. And I know a lot of my constituents still today on, on the reservation still travel long distances. And then there's times when, uh, the, as you mentioned earlier, the groundwater levels and things like that are very low and the quality is poor. And still to this day, we have Navajo people that are just like myself, even though I'm only 36 years old, hauled water, drink uh, windmill water that's supposed to be for livestock. And I know a lot of our people are still doing that as of today. So I think that uh, it's really made it tough for our people to uh, stop worrying about basic essentials of life. And uh, if we can cover those basic necessities, then we can start moving forward into building ourselves up even stronger. So that's, thank you, Senator. Yeah, um, it means a lot that you're here, Mr. President. And I think the power of your testimony and the stories that have been shared already, um, I think what's best is just to let that sink in, um, to understand where so many across the country can turn on a spigot in the comfort of their home. There's water. We, we have to do better. Yeah, yield back. Thank you very much, Senator Lujan. Vice Chair Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for the, the testimony today. Um, uh, as, as Senator Lujan has just mentioned, um, when you're talking about something as basic as water, um, we, we know that we have room to improve, and, and hopefully uh, the measures in front of us will allow for that. Uh, Couple questions. Um, I'm going to start with you, Secretary Newland, and and Mr. Crockett. Um, with regards to the the Leech Lake bill, um, the Interior Department. I think we, we we we're agreeing on the facts here in terms of of what happened. Uh, Interior illegally sold off land that be belonged to members of the the Leech Lake band. Uh, it shouldn't have happened. The tribe needs to be made whole. I think we are absolutely in agreement there. You, you, you state that the bill, S-616, would also authorize an acre-for-acre -acre substitution of lands within the Chippewa National Forest um, if the band identifies certain parcels as unsuitable for future use. So I'm just trying to wrap my head around how this actually works in terms of a process. Would the tribe have the ability to turn back their entitlement lands that were identified as, as wrongly transferred and then pick other national forest system land if they view that their entitlement parcels are unsuitable for future use? And I guess what I'm trying to, to figure out is who determines what is unsuitable. Is that, is that the tribe? Um, what does that mean within DOI's view? And then, Mr. Crockett, I'm going to can I ask you a similar type question here? Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to misspeak on that, as I think that would be a, a legal conclusion um, about that term. So, I, if it's okay with you, I'd uh, like to provide a, a written answer as a follow-up. That, that's good. I'm, what I'm also trying to understand is not only the definition, but who determines. Is it DOI or is it the tribe that determines that it's un, unsuitable? Again, uh, Madam Vice Chair, I'm not prepared to answer that question. They would be happy to follow up. Okay. All right. Um, let me ask you then, uh, 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 Deputy um, Associate Deputy Chief for State, Private, and Tribal Forestry. Um, you got a big long title there, but it's USDA. It's forestry, and so I'm 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 trying to understand whether or not Forest Service has has specific views on, on, on this new authority that we have within this legislation that allows the department to substitute alternative national forest um, system lands for the acres that the tribe is entitled to. And, and again, if you have a better handle on how the process works, I'm, I'm eager to hear that as well. Sure, thank you for the question. So uh, I'll share my understanding of it. And uh, so my understanding is the tribe and the forest work together to collaboratively determine uh, the suitability for uh, for the acres that are identified. Okay. I don't think they're going back and saying, all right, we already had this acre and we want to exchange it for a different acre. 
They're looking at the acres that were identified under the original legislation, the 11,000 uh, acres. And as they're adding to the 4,000 plus acres under the proposed legislation, um, they work hand in hand to determine suitability. As you heard, um, um, Mr. Finday talk about the cultural, economic, and residential needs. Those are gonna be some of the driving factors that they're gonna be looking at. And then the Forest Service will look at those and make sure that they're in alignment with the forest plan for the Chippewa National Forest. And uh, that process helps to determine the suitability. So have there been um, discussions yet between Forest Service and the tribe on, on which, which lands we might be talking about, whether, whether there's maps or surveys or appraisals um, that would be transferred to, to Interior? So, so there have been conversation. I also think it's important to make sure that we're connecting the uh, 11,000 acres and the original, uh, the, the legislation from a few years ago with the uh, 4,000 acres that are being proposed under the technical amendments. So for the 11,000 acres, yep, they have maps that they've, okay. they've identified. They're about 95% uh, complete through that process and ready to go uh, out with uh, public. Uh, and so they've had a conversation around that. Okay. For the acres yeah. that are being proposed, uh, no map exists for it. They're in conversations around it. They haven't identified the acre for acre opportunity there. Uh, um, and so that, that part would still have to happen. Just recognizing that things around here don't necessarily move very quickly. It seems to me that if there was, if, if there were um, ident identified areas or maps that we're talking about, um, you know, the process moves forward a little bit more quickly um, rather than kind of this, it seems a bit open-ended, I guess, as I'm looking at, at the process that has been laid out. Um, I'm a little bit over time, but I wanted to ask the Lieutenant Governor a question, and this is something that actually I could ask to anybody on the panel here this afternoon, um, but uh, I, I think we have recognized that um, when we're talking about any of these, these water uh, projects, we have seen, um, we've seen costs escalate uh, considerably uh, due to in inflation. Um, uh, it's my understanding that um, the original cost, the original amount authorized under the 2009 Act was two, uh, $870 million. Um, uh, needs, Congress needs to provide another $750 million to, to build additional water treatment plants. Um, Inflation added on. I, I, I guess the question that I would ask you, um, as the the lieutenant governor here, is we're, we're we're looking at a settlement that authorizes repair for the canals. Um, the bill says that the secretary's obligation to complete the project will be deemed fulfilled, even if they can't complete the project due to insufficient appropriations. So the the the. The worry that I've got in the back of my head is that reclamation cost estimates or, or inflation could potentially force the settlement parties to come back to Congress for, for more funding to complete the project. Is this a concern? Is this a worry? Um, can, you, can you give some assurance here today on, on whether or not uh, the estimates are, are going to hold and we're not going to be in a situation where, where you're having to come back here after all of this great work with a negotiated process. Um, Vice Chair Murkowski, in Section 14 under funding, there's also a clause that relates to fluctuation in costs that provides that the amounts authorized to be appropriated will be increased or decreased by a cost of inflation, so that should help address some of those concerns with regard to the Fresno and the St. Mary units of the Milk River project. Uh, the Bureau of Reclamation has done, th this has been in the works for several years in projecting those costs and we feel uh, good about the cost for those particular projects and I'm not as familiar with the, um, the Lake El Elwell, but I do know this is a somewhat unique report approach and that um, plans are going to be submitted to the Secretary of the Interior as these projects are proposed and go forward. There will be an opportunity um, uh, to address costs within the appropriations. But of course, to the extent they exceed that and the cost of inflation built in, 
the tribes will be required to come back and request additional funding or else scale down the projects right. or perhaps not, not fill one of the projects. So you raise an issue that I'd, I'd like to finish off uh, my question uh, back to you, uh, Secretary, Secretary Newland, and this um, relates to the fact that uh, it's, it's kind of unusual um, that the tribe is designated as uh, lead agency for repairing and expanding the BIA irrigation system that's going to serve the tribe. Um, so I guess the question is, is, is how unusual is this? Is this the first time uh, that we've seen it? Um, it's usually Bureau of Rec that, that leads these projects. Is, is this a good thing, bad thing? Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, the more recent settlements typically designate the Bureau of Reclamation as, as the lead agency for that work. And, and as we highlighted in our submitted testimony, that, that's, that remains our suggestion to the committee is to designate Bureau of Reclamation for that work. Um, their, uh, their expertise and experience on doing this work under many of the recent settlements and their ability to bring them to completion, um, I think, uh, demonstrates that, that that would be a better course. Good. I appreciate that. I, I, I thank you for the willingness to, to again, we're trying to figure out how we, uh, how we find resolution not to throw more roadblocks in. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I may, Senator Lujan. just to follow up on the vice chair's comments there, I, I very much appreciate that line of questioning because with the water settlement I was proud to carry in the house back in 2009 for the Amet water settlement for four Pueblos um, in the community where I live. Um, later on, the Bureau of Reclamation came back and said they're going to smart size the project. I thought, well, that sounds pretty good. Well, smart sizing means cutting. <laughs> it's a horrible term. But because of the authorities inherently given in, they look at the scope of the project that was, was needed as Congress passed, and then they go in and then they smart size it, they chop the project, there's not enough water, there's not enough lateral, as opposed to coming back to try to fight for funding. So I, I very much appreciate what, what you were just asking there. You know, If there's a chance, Mr. Chairman, to pursue it, um, to look into that more, I, I'd very much be interested in it. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Lujan. Uh, I do not have any questions. Um, I will submit a couple uh, for the record, but I really want to uh, thank this esteemed panel, especially our tribal leaders and our state leaders. Uh, I know it's a, a long journey and um, it can, you don't, none of you seem intimidated, but it can be an intimidating process. So we really appreciate you coming uh, before the committee and we're gonna try to get these bills marked up uh, and enacted uh, as expeditiously as possible. If there are no more questions for our witnesses, members may also submit follow-up written questions for the record. The hearing record will remain open for two weeks and I wanna thank all of the witnesses for their time and their testimony. This hearing is adjourned.